This is Dr. Neil Burney. He lives in Bermuda, a stunning Atlantic island 640 miles east of North Carolina, USA. So now the, yeah. He spent the last 30 years practicing veterinary medicine, but now he's transferring his veterinary skills to help save, protect, and learn more about the incredible marine life of Bermuda's ocean. This is a completely wild shark. Alongside his dedicated ocean vet team are a number of scientists, yeah, this and here, marine this biologists, off the back fin. and specialist master divers, helping to perform a number of unique and dangerous procedures in a bid to safeguard critically important marine species. Together, the team will be fitting satellite tags to huge tiger sharks, saving precious green turtles, dissecting giant blue marlin and obtaining unique toxin samples from 45-ton migrating humpback whales. Yay! Whoa! My knees are like jello. Yes, man. This is Bermuda, home to Dr. Neil Burney, the ocean vet. The Galapagos shark, once one of the most abundant shark species found in the waters around Bermuda. These apex predators play a fundamental role in the health of the marine ecosystem, helping to control the delicate balance of life in oceans all over the world. Over the last 60 years, a rapid increase of sharks caught globally has had a devastating effect on Galapagos shark numbers casting serious doubt over its long-term survival. I've got him, I've got him, he's in tonic, Ian, we got to In this episode of Ocean Vet, Neil and his team have been called in to help release a sick Galapagos shark from the Bermuda Aquarium's North Rock tank. We're gonna transfer him into the stretcher on three, two, one, go. To ensure this fish survives, Neil and his crew face a challenging mission to transport the animal seven miles offshore for release at a protected marine reserve. As we release the fish, I'm gonna make sure that he can swim strongly. Neil and his crew will also have a rare encounter with a blue shark while on a mission to catch a large Galapagos shark to implant a powerful satellite tracking tag. Now I'm going to insert this large PISA archival tag into the fish. The team's goal is to begin a new scientific study, tracking these sharks to see if they make long-range migrations from the Bermuda platform. OK, give me the hose out the hose. Together with his ocean vet crew, Neil faces some of his toughest challenges in a bid to help save and learn more about the majestic Galapagos shark. Good morning, Roma. Good morning. Neil's veterinary expertise have been called upon by the Bermuda Aquarium to help with the release of their captive Galapagos shark. Behaving himself? Oh, yeah, he's waiting for Let's you. Let's hope. We've just got to hope his behavior is good. We've got to hope this shark behaves himself and comes easily into our capture net. The aquarium's resident Galapagos shark, Desmond, has developed lesions on his nose. These injuries have been sustained by the shark banging against the walls of the tank, trying to avoid the bullying of the larger and more aggressive black grouper. After several weeks under observation, Neil has seen no improvement in the shark's condition, so its best chance of survival lies with it being released. We're gonna have Neil on the head in terms of... The aquarium's chief curator, Dr. Ian Walker, aquarium collector, Stephen Davies, and series marine biologist, Choi Ming, will be capturing the shark with Neil, loading it onto a stretcher and rushing it to a tank waiting on the ocean vet boat, Bones. There's a lot on the line here. And we're very concerned about the health of this particular shark. We really are concerned for his welfare. We don't want to lose him during this capture and release process. To ensure this shark stands the best chance of making a full recovery from its injuries, North Rock has been selected by the team as a release location. This protected marine reserve will enable this shark to make a full and speedy recovery 
and its close proximity to the aquarium will minimize stress to the animal during transport. We're a little frustrated at the moment because we've been waiting quite a few minutes for the shark. He's made a couple passes at the net, but he turns off every time. So we've added a little bit of bait to the net to try and entice him just a little bit more. And uh, we'll see how it goes. We're getting some progress, but not what we want. Eventually, the shark's interest in the baited net increases. Neil's capture team is poised, and the boat is standing by for transport. It looks like the team's plan might just come off. Here he is. Here he is. As the team lift the shark, it manages to wriggle free from the net. The shark is now dangerously out of control and risks further injury to itself or one of the capture team. Specialist collector Gus has no option and plunges the shark into the standby tank. Hold him upside down, tonic. Okay. We've got the shark upside down in tonic. We're going to transfer him into the stretcher on three, two, one, go. With sharks only able to survive out of water for short periods of time, the team have a strict 35-minute time frame to get this shark to its release location. It's small. I got a tiny cradle. OK. With the shark safely transferred to the truck, Neil runs to meet the team by the ocean vet boat. The truck is coming behind me. I'm just going to prepare the boat for the shark. You have three minutes, 25 seconds. OK. Transferring the shark to the stretcher. He's in the stretcher. They're the stretcher out. Stretcher's going to burn. Yep, yep, yep. With the shark en route to the team's boat, Niels focuses on stabilizing the animal for the journey to its release location. I'm making sure the shark has water flow across his gills by keeping this hose in his mouth. He's biting onto it, so we know that he's vigorous. I'm just going to check his eye reflex. Just needs switch. And he's great. Good. How are you doing? doing great, man. That tail. With the transfer taking just under four minutes, Neil and the team can now focus on the shark's welfare as they make the journey out to the North Rock Marine Reserve. So to provide vital life support to this shark while he's in the tank, we have two things going for him. First of all, we've got highly oxygenated water running through this pipe directly over his gills. And secondly, my good friend Gus here is acting as physiotherapist. He is actively massaging the shark's muscles, making him swim to move any lactic acid out of his muscles and let that oxygen work on him. So we had considered releasing this shark with an archival transmitting tank. However, after measuring him and looking at his weight, we've decided that this tank would produce too much drag on this small shark. We are, however, going to place this National Marine Fisheries Service tag in the shark so that if he's ever captured, we'll get the data from his retrieval. Inserting tags into sharks causes them little discomfort. As most sharks lack nociceptors, the nerves that send pain signals to the brain. The shark's movement here is actually associated with it briefly exiting tonic immobility. There it is. So here's the National Marine Fisheries toe tag placed and good well. The team have arrived at the release location. The shark has been in Neil's care for a total of 25 minutes, well under the 35-minute target. Support rib pilot Dylan Ward is ready to deploy underwater cameraman Andrew Kirkpatrick, and Dr. Ian Walker is taking control of primary care. I'm going to get, I'm going to put on a pair of fins, a mask, and a belt, and if, as we release the fish, I'm going to make sure that he can swim strongly. Entering the water to help revive this animal is a crucial part of Neil's role. Most sharks are obligate ram ventilators, meaning they need to move forward to breathe. Neil has assisted the revival of large tiger sharks and even large pelagic species like the blue marlin. Hopefully, this Galapagos shark will revive itself. But in case it doesn't, Neil will be standing by. About five feet, you're right at the perfect spot. Okay. That's perfect. Are you ready? Three, right. Good. Two, one, go. Are right, you ready? The team's mission has been a huge success. And releasing this young shark into the ocean will not only improve the health of this marine ecosystem, but should see this Galapagos shark fully recover. Phenomenal. Strong swim away, beautiful release. The fish turned around. He came back over the sand and headed right down into the reefs. 
I think he's home. Three, two, one, go. So far, the team have completed the challenging task of transporting a sick Galapagos shark from the Bermuda Aquarium for successful release into a protected marine reserve. The team are now positioned at Argus Bank, 35 miles off Bermuda's shore. You take over there? Yeah. Neil and his crew are beginning a new scientific study on Galapagos sharks, attaching satellite tags to reveal their migrations. So we're out on Argus Banks and we've been chumming and fishing for a couple of hours and a group of smaller sharks have just turned up in our chum line. They're not tigers, they're either Galapagos or silkies. We don't often get a chance to get in the water and swim with these smaller sharks. I'm keen to do that. It can be aggressive, could be a little bit dangerous, but very exciting. I'm keen to learn more about the behavior of these sharks. Like other shark species, these animals have an aggressive reputation. But in Neil's experience, this is not always a reality. So I'm down at around 40 feet of water. There's a few of these sharks around, but this one is particularly bold and playful. This is a completely wild shark, and yet it's happy to approach me on scuba gear and take food straight from my hand. Certainly something that I've never experienced before. What an incredible experience. Recent studies on sharks have revealed they are far more intelligent than once thought. Their behavior here is far more curious and inquisitive than dangerous and aggressive. Galapagos sharks tend to form large groups, which may help them navigate better over long distances. Some scientists have identified some shark migratory pathways more complex than those of birds. Something our tanks should reveal. Shark behavior can change very quickly. As they become more confident, their instinct is to further investigate. This incredible blue shark is particularly interested in Andrew Kirkpatrick, the team's underwater videographer. It's likely attracted to the electromagnetic field surrounding the camera. No one is in any immediate danger, but it goes to show how quickly the unexpected turns up in deep blue water. I think I just fed one of those sharks not 10 inches from my face. We're going to put a bait down now, try and capture one. If it's a Galapagos shark, we're going to put a tag in it, track it around the ocean. Really excited. We also had a blue shark come up, play with me just like a puppy dog, got to feed him by hand. What a day out here on Argus. Phenomenal. Woo! That's what I'm talking about. Oh, that was incredible down there. Literally, it's like you're one of them just sort of swimming amongst them. They don't pay you any peace of mind. They're just going after the bait that we're chucking over. And it's just, it's just sort of surreal just being down there, just sort of gliding with them. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah, buddy. So good. So good. Hey, well done, nice. Neil. Hey, that was some good stuff, man. <laughs> okay, your crotch is in my face. Bonding, so. <laughs> After the success of the dive, the team's attention quickly turns to catching one of these sharks for the first tag implant procedure. Hang on, I think I've got but catching and tagging a Galapagos shark is no easy task. While Dylan Ward, the team's fisherman, preps Neil's shark rods, Choi prepares the important satellite tag. Each of these satellite tags costs about $5,000. So there's considerable investment financially and scientifically in each tag. To date, we've put out over $100,000 worth of these satellite tags, mainly on tiger sharks. And they've revealed some fantastic information. We've basically seen uh, the migration routes they take in and out of the Caribbean and out and around the Atlantic. This is the first one that we're gonna put out on a wild Galapagos shark. So the results should be really exciting as well. The team's work with tiger sharks has enabled policymakers to develop shark protection policies. The goal is to now extend this work to Galapagos sharks so that they can benefit from similar protection. 
Back on the boat, Neil doesn't have to wait long for some interest in his bait. So it's not, oh, I was going to say, it's not pulling us quite as hard as the, as the uh, tiger sharks pull. So hopefully we've got a Galapagos shark here. With a potential shark on the line, Kirkpatrick is deployed into the water. This isn't only to film the animal, but also to provide information on the shark's status, ensuring the animal is unharmed during the capture process. So this shark is considerably larger than the shark we released from the North Rock tank, probably four or five times the size and considerably more powerful. People underrate the fighting ability of uh, Galapagos sharks, but I personally do not. These guys put up a hell of a struggle on this gear. Pound for pound, the Galapagos shark is one of the most powerful fish in the ocean. Securing the tail is key to disabling the animal's power. Good job, Dylan. Good job. Grab the leader. Grab the leader, Jack, yeah, yeah, yeah. With the tail disabled, Dylan carefully holds the shark at the back of the boat, ready for the lift. OK, three, two, one, go! Neil's primary objective is to secure a saltwater hose that will provide vital oxygen to this shark during the tagging procedure. So, the hose is in, ensuring he has water supply over his gills. I'm keeping his eyes covered, and I've got his electrical receptors, which are these little pits that you see here, also under the towel. And we think that this contributes to keeping this animal quiet. It's one of the ways to put an animal in tonic is to stimulate these electrical receptors, the organs of Lorenzini. Yeah. There he is. The flow of water over the shark's gills is crucial while in the team's care. This simple but effective life support system ensures the shark's bloodstream is fully oxygenated. The hose is making sure the water is flowing over his gills. It's running out through his gill slots here. We can see it running out here. It's running out over here, particularly flowing well over on this side. Perfect. We've got him well oxygenated. We're going to cut this hook and then take it out like that, and we're going to re remove the hook. Hook is free. Basically, uh, we're gloving up. Uh, even though we're in the wild, we're trying to keep the environment as sterile as possible, particularly as we are going to break the animal's skin slightly in order to insert the tag. So if I was in my animal hospital, I'd prepare the site with iodine. I'm going to prepare the site with povidone iodine, make a small stab incision, like so. Now I'm going to insert this large piece of archival tag into the fish. As so. I'm going to pull it back, make sure it snugs in nicely into the skin, which it does. This is how it's going to lie. There is a small wound here where we've placed it, but this will close over very rapidly. We're now going to take a, a DNA clip. This small wound will cause the shark little discomfort, and it is a small price for it to pay in order to benefit its entire species. OK, so we've got our DNA clip here. We've just cut a little nick off the back fin. This is going to, uh, this DNA sample is going to go to the Guy Harvey Research Institute in Florida. We've been working with them for several years, and they've been collecting DNA on sharks all over the world. And what we're going to do is send it off, and they're going to genetically map the Galapagos population of Bermuda and see how related it is to other Galapagos populations throughout the world. So lots of science going on, multiple parties. We're getting as much wild data off this animal as possible while we have him for our brief few minutes on the boat. Also, besides doing measurement, we like to see the sex of the shark. It's nice to know uh, the ratio of males to females in Bermuda, even though we've just started doing this research. And you can clearly see here, he has two hemipenes. And you can tell this guy is not mature because the hemipenes are soft. These guys grow to about 10 foot in length and 400 pounds as a maximum. That's pretty much the size. They usually live about 20 years, but it takes them at least 10 of those years before they sexually mature. I'd say in this shape, he's definitely going to make it to adulthood and reproduce and hopefully give us some fantastic satellite data on his movements. I'm going to get in the water, supervise the release of this fish. If he doesn't swim strongly, I'm going to be able to push him through the water and force water over his gills as we've had water go in here. If he swims away strongly, I'm just going to watch him go on his way. Let's both get behind the bottles. Yep, yep, yep. good. One on each side. Yep. Yeah. You got, okay, you got that other one? Yep. Okay, yeah. Cool. yeah. All right, pull them up. There we go. Right okay. on. You got I think so. Yep. All right. Here All right. we go. Let's good luck, my go. friend. See you later, buddy. Seven.
The release of this tagged Galapagos shark represents the first important step of Neil and his team's study. With additional migration data from other Galapagos sharks, conservationists can understand where these animals migrate to and whether these areas require greater protections to preserve the populations of these animals. Absolutely phenomenal. The shark was kicking hard. He turned himself around, almost got caught under the engines, and then I was just guiding him down, and he just took off straight down into the deep. Beautiful release. Oh, ecstatic. I am ecstatic. Woo. Since the filming of this project, the track on this shark revealed a migration of over 400 miles east of Bermuda. One, go! For Neil and his team, this information is the first part of the puzzle to understanding where these sharks go and what dangers they face. This shark is the first of many the team will tag over the coming months. Their work will help to ensure this remarkable species is part of Bermuda's magical marine ecosystem for years to come. Next time on Ocean Vet, Neil and his crew are on a mission to save the spotted eagle ray. Straight into the house, thanks. In this position, it's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Oxygen on. Teaming up with international scientists and local experts, the team will be studying and protecting these stunning rays in Bermuda's crystal clear waters. This is Dr. Neil Burney. He lives in Bermuda, a stunning Atlantic island 640 miles east of North Carolina, USA. So now the, yeah. He spent the last 30 years practicing veterinary medicine, but now he's transferring his veterinary skills to help save, protect, and learn more about the incredible marine life of Bermuda's ocean. This is a completely wild shark. Alongside his dedicated ocean vet team are a number of scientists, yeah, this and probably, yeah, marine this biologists, off the back fin. and specialist master divers, helping to perform a number of unique and dangerous procedures in a bid to safeguard critically important marine species. Together, the team will be fitting satellite tags to huge tiger sharks, saving precious green turtles, dissecting giant blue marlin and obtaining unique toxin samples from 45-ton migrating humpback whales. Yay! Whoa! My knees are like jello. Yes, man. This is Bermuda, home to Dr. Neil Burney, the ocean vet. The spotted eagle ray is one of the most strikingly beautiful marine animals, covered in a spotted pattern that is unique to each and every ray. In Bermuda, these rays are heavily protected, but throughout some of the rest of the world, it's a different story. Now categorized as near threatened, the future survival of this species is uncertain. Straight into the house, thanks. In this position, it's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Oxygen on. In this episode, Neil and his ocean vet crew patrol Bermuda's beautiful inshore waters on a scientific mission to protect the spotted eagle ray. I can handle a probe if you wish. Utilizing his extensive veterinary skills, Neil and his ocean vet team will perform a number of unique procedures to collect vitally important data from these beautiful marine animals. So we'll give this to you and you can slide this under him. By employing tried and tested capture methods alongside some of the very latest technology, Neil and his crew's skill will be tested to the limit as they attempt to corral and capture these rays in some of Bermuda's most idyllic surroundings. You never know what you're going to find here in the Bermuda Triangle. To assist him on this testing mission, Neil has assembled his ocean vet crew at the Bermuda Aquarium dock. This weather, this day, epic. We're going to get three or four rays today, for sure. As always, Neil is assisted by series marine biologist Choi Aming, underwater cameraman Andrew Kirkpatrick, boat pilot Dylan Ward, and support rib pilot Oscar Doyce. 
The team are also joined by spotted eagle ray scientist Dr. Matt Ajamian, ultrasonographer Lati Reining, aerial drone pilot Johnny Singleton, and Chris Fluck from Bermuda Conservation Services. Their combined experience and expertise is essential to the success of Neil and his crew's mission. So about four or five years ago, Dr. Matt Ajamian carried out his PhD work on Bermuda's spotted eagle rays. He answered a lot of the questions about their feeding behavior and their local migratory movements. However, two key questions remain unanswered. One, does our population of eagle rays differ from those found in the Gulf of Mexico? And secondly, do any of our rays undergo long-term migrations from the Bermuda platform? This year, we're gonna take a lot of DNA samples from some of these fish, and also, we're gonna attach archival satellite tags, and that way, hopefully, we can answer long-term migratory movement questions on these fish. The exact tag that we're putting on a lot of... By attaching satellite tags and collecting DNA samples, Neil and his team can determine if these rays migrate off-island and how their genetic identity compares with other ray populations. So these rays that we're seeing here, this is about an average-sized female. Combined with Matt's previous data, this will prove if this species is totally endemic to Bermuda. This would be a scientific breakthrough. If Bermuda's spotted eagle rays are proved to be endemic, then the conservation data on these protected rays can be used as a benchmark for unprotected populations, helping to establish an effective conservation strategy to protect this species all over the world. All right, so the first thing we need to do is get a ray. So what we're gonna do is head out in this boat using this jack net, put it in the water and circle the ray, put it on the boat and then transport it back here to the aquarium where we're gonna take our samples and attach our satellite tag. Now rays are very powerful and potentially dangerous. So the first thing we're gonna do is put it into this anesthesia bath here. So here's our pool set up. We've got oxygenated water in here and we're gonna use clove oil to anesthetize our fish. Matt, why are we choosing clove oil for our anesthetic? Well, Neil, clove oil is a naturally occurring uh, anesthetic and it has a variety of uses, but really is effective on marine fishes and uh, should put these rays under in a comfortable level so we can do all of our procedures. Excellent, and it's a naturally occurring material, so we have no problems with disposal that you do with some of the synthetic anesthetic agents. Let's go catch an eagle ray. Let's do it. Matt's research proved that Harrington Sound is an eagle ray hotspot. This large body of inland water provided over 50 sightings during Matt's study. These rays were often observed cruising the perimeter of the sound or gliding across the shallow bays of some of its beautiful islands. So we're here at a fantastic location on the backside of Trunk Island here in Harrington Sound. This is a great location to try and find eagle rays because this sand bed here is full of calico clams, one of their preferred foods. Hopefully we'll find two or three in here. Once sighted, encircling these rays with a capture net requires a great deal of skill and experience. These fish are fast, unpredictable, and highly maneuverable. So we found our first eagle ray. It's up here on the shallow sand flats right behind the island. What we're gonna do? Uh, I want you to come like up here somewhere. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. So we're deploying the net. We've come right in against the shoreline. We're deploying the net, and we're going to try and capture this ray. Yeah, yeah. Just guide it. Don't even touch it. Don't even touch it. All right, cool. So we can see our ray is about 20 yards off the bow of the boat, and he's heading towards the corner where we put the net to start with. This is going perfectly at the moment. Lottie's going to jump in the water just to kind of give the ray a bit of a scare towards the net because sometimes they go one way or the other. So we like to have a swimmer in there just to have a body there and it kind of scares the ray in one direction and that ensures us being able to net it. Lottie also has the crucial task of closing off any gaps at the bottom of the net. Even the smallest hole can be an escape route for one of these rays. At the surface, Oscar and Matt have the challenging task of trying to maneuver the heavy net around this ray without it escaping. See if you can scare him into the bay, Oscar. Just do your best. This is like cat and mouse with an eagle ray, highly mobile 
and actually highly intelligent. They have one of the biggest brain sizes per body mass of any fish. And this guy is trying to outwit us right here, right now. But not to be outmaneuvered by this ray, Neil deploys the rest of his team to close off any escape routes. This is a crucial moment. One slip now, and his team could lose this ray for good. So the eagle ray is right here in front of us, heading towards Chris. Our job right now is to keep him corralled as we gradually get this net smaller and smaller so we can capture this ray. The reason we brought the camera is because uh, the eagle rays actually have a spotted pattern on the back, and it's actually a unique spot pattern on every ray. So if we get a good photo of it, it's like a fingerprint. So what Matt's going to do is uh, he's going to keep them, and basically we can catalog all the rays so we can identify each individual ray by its pattern. So we'll give this to you, and you can slide this under him. Neil and his team must be extremely careful working close to this animal. These rays are equipped with several venomous barbs located at the base of their tails. If one of these barbs were to puncture a vital organ, the effects could be fatal. Okay. All right, you guys got that? Right. Do you yeah. have that right now? Huh? Yeah, yeah. I have it. You got the tape? I'm good. Yeah, the tape's right here. Do you want to... So we have our ray safely in the boat. I'm going to get the tape, and we're going to tape its barbs. These are the very dangerous five to six inch long venomous barbs and sadly made most famous by the death of the late Steve Irwin who took a six inch long stingray barb through the heart. We're going to make sure that doesn't happen to any of us. We're going to tape these barbs up close to his tail to get out of the danger. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Our priorities are taping up the barbs and getting water into his yeah. gills. So I'm holding the mouth open. Matt has just put water in the gills so he's got flow over the gills. You can see water coming out there. He's in good shape. We're just going to put a towel over his eyes just so he can't see what's going on to keep his stress level low. Okay. You can actually see this guy. With the ray now secure and stabilized, Neil is satisfied it can be safely transported back to the Bermuda Aquarium. So we're running full speed and Matt is checking the flow and the water is flowing over his gills. And we're almost at the aquarium. We're almost there. This guy has become one of the Ocean Vet research crew. He's being honored to be allowed to wear the shirt. Very nice. Good job, everybody. Yeah. What a wicked team. Neil and his team have successfully transported their captured ray back to the Bermuda Aquarium for sampling. Straight into the hands, thanks. In this position, it's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Oxygen on? Yeah, okay, we'll turn it on now. So our ray is in his anesthetic solution. He's in the clove oil. He's gradually going to get a little sedated, we hope. And then we're going to go ahead. We're going to get a blood sample. We're going to get a DNA clip. And we're going to attach our archival satellite tag. To minimize unnecessary stress to this animal, Neil is keen to complete the procedures as quickly as possible. All right, thanks, Matt. So this is our archival pop-off tag. And we're going to implant this. It's going to release after six months. It's going to come to the surface and deploy and upload all the information about this ray's movements during those six months. We're That's going right. to put this right through the muscular tissue either side of the vertebra of this fish's tail. That's right. And it's going to go right through, just like so. And as it gets pushed through, uh, this tube is going to go with it. And as you can see, this ray is not bothered by this procedure. The clove oil is working brilliantly. All so right. now so I'm going to plant the tube on this side, correct? Right here. This is very similar to some of the procedures we use when we're doing our small animal practice, particularly when I'm doing fracture repairs in small cats or dogs. We thread a wire under the jaw in exactly the same way. Beautiful. So we have a smooth connection from our swivel, from our tag, to our swivel, to our fish, to our ray, I should say, and we're good to go. This is going to trail behind him and offer minimal drag as he swims through the water column. With the health of this ray also a key focus, Neil, Choi, and Matt take some vital blood samples. So, Matt, why are we going to draw this blood sample from this ray? This blood's going to actually give us a little insight into the physiology of these animals, how healthy they are, what types of toxins are actually in them as well. And we can also use some of this tissue that we're going to draw from our clip to get DNA analysis, right, and compare Correct this with other populations. Yes, sir. This DNA sample will be sent to scientists in California and compared with other ray populations to determine if Bermuda's rays are indeed genetically unique. Good, okay, we're good. All 
right, so let's move this back. ray. With the welfare of this ray Neil's top priority, he's keen to begin reviving the animal as soon as possible. It's starting to come out a little bit, which is good. Okay. All right, so we've got the ray moved into our recovery bath. We've got our oxygenation stone in. Choi is actually running fresh water directly over his gills. We're going to get rid of all that clove oil anesthetic from this fish, wake him up, get him weighed, and get him back into the oh, ocean. Yeah, there he goes. Yeah. Pumping I can hard. feel it. It's like almost like a little tongue sticking out, licking my hand. With all of their procedures taking just over 10 minutes, Neil has ensured the stress to this ray has been kept to a minimum. Okay, we're going to lift him onto the frame. And with the clove oil solution now purged from this ray, Neil is confident the animal is strong enough to be released. So, do you want to grab the back end? Got to grab the back end. Okay, let's get him off. So I'm just bringing him off. And as we can see, I can assess his spherical movement. And we're going to wait until we have some movement oh. of his fins. And yeah. once we do, we're going to see he's already starting to move. So we're now in a position to release the vet wrap from his tail, leave his barbs free. And just for the audience above here who's looking down, this is what we do not want to get caught by. I so this theory. one, these venomous barbs are what we were trying to avoid earlier. But now as we release this fish, we can leave him with his protection in case he comes into contact with something that he needs to protect himself from in the future. In Bermuda, this animal faces threats from large marine predators, such as tiger sharks and even hammerheads. But in other oceans, these animals are also hunted by bull sharks and black tips. I think he's, yeah. he's getting ready to go. So I'm so ready, whenever, Joy? Yeah, whenever you, you guys him? release, I'll just follow him just to ensure that he looks good and swims away healthy. There he goes, and he's gliding down as we watch him. Yeah. Perfect. So that's our first Eagle Ray tagged and released. We've got a few more to go, but it's looking very good so far. Neil and his team will have to wait and see if the DNA samples and satellite tag data corroborate Matt's theory that Bermuda's Eagle Rays are endemic to the island. But it's not just strategies like this that help ensure this animal's survival. At the Bermuda Aquarium, their team of scientists also respond to reports of injured marine animals. When a call comes in about an injured spotted eagle ray, Neil and his ocean vet crew are the first to respond. So we've received a call from a resident of Harrington Sound just up here. He's seen an injured eagle ray in front of his property. It looks like he's got a laceration to the wing and some abrasions, and it's circling in the same place all the time, so it doesn't look well. We're gonna see if we can assess it in the water, and if we think it needs to be captured to help treat it, that's what we're gonna do. Oh, hang on, hang on, he's right in front of us. So you got a spot on He's right in front of us, he's right here. Yeah. Looks like he's 20 yards off the stern of the boat. Right there, right? And he's heading out right now. So we can see the laceration on the left side of the wing, and it's about a third of the way in from the tip, yeah. but, the ray is adapting to it and is swimming pretty strongly right now. It's incredible considering it's almost the, the wing is actually cut and basically it's kind of flat like a chunk, like tilting like that, but she still managed to swim fine. So it just shows the resiliency of these animals. I won't say it's cosmetic, but I don't think it's life threatening. And so I think the stress of us bringing her in in a pr already a stressed animal and further stressing it, I think would not be the best call. So that's the call for now. We're not going to net this ray, and we're going to leave her be, but we're going to monitor her. That's exactly what we should do. Back at the dock, Neil and his team are keen to go in search of a second ray, but there's a problem. So unfortunately, we've developed an oil leak on one of our engines, which has basically stopped us from using this boat. So we've transferred the net out, and we're going to go with the aquarium boat called the Chevron. Floggy, what do you think? Things happen, we just go with the punches. Man. Got to roll with roll it, man. Roll. Got to roll with it, keep smiling. Gonna go hunt for an eagle ray, just using a different boat. With time slipping away, this could be their final chance. So we've just seen a ray coming along the edge of this shoreline over here to behind me. We're gonna park the net on this promontory here, and we're gonna reverse back and try and encircle this ray in the bay. We've got the helicopter up over the net, we're gonna see if he can spot him. Neil and his team face a much sterner challenge this time. The overall visibility is poor, and the lead lining at the bottom of the net is entangled on the seabed. 
So I'm going to go and try and be another hand on the lead line, try and get it freed up so we can get around this ray. Neil's drone has zeroed in on the ray's location, and the team now face the challenging task of trying to free the net without letting the ray escape. Four feet off the bottom. All right, come on this side and tend the hole there. I'm trying to, there's a four foot hole under All the right, ray. The hole. If you don't tend that hole. As the team begins to think they might lose this ray, Neil and Andrew Kirkpatrick spot it, making a break for a gap in the net. My ray identification skills are good. It is a female. With the ray now located and the net freed from the bottom, Neil and the team can maneuver it into a safe position for capture. The ray is right down in here. We're just about to pinch everything off and lift her out of the water. It is a girl, exactly what we've been looking for. The fact this ray is a female is hugely significant. It means that Neil can ultrasound this ray to see if it is carrying pups. Data on this animal's reproductive cycle is extremely rare and would be a significant addition to the other data they've collected. So we're on the run, heading as fast as we can back to the aquarium dock. We have the ray comfortably covered, eyes are covered. The water, watch this water flowing out of these spiracles. Beautiful, it means she's being well oxygenated by the water from the barrel at the back. Back at the aquarium, Neil and his team's priority is to anesthetize the animal as quickly as possible. So we're bringing the ray straight up and into the anesthetic. Beautiful. Although at first the ray appears distressed, by temporarily covering its eyes and allowing the clove oil to take effect, the animal is soon calm and fully anesthetized. So we're gonna bring Lottie Reining from Dolphin Quest in, who's our ultrasonographer. And she's gonna let us see whether there are any immature rays inside this adult ray. So Lottie, what do you think? Let's see, Exciting let's stuff. have a look. All right. So we'll slide her a little bit forward so that you can reach. She seems really comfortable Perfect. in this anesthetic solution. I'm just gonna move the camera out of the way a little bit. So what we're looking for is movement within the stilomic or body cavity. If there are any small rays, they'll be rather like little wrapped up tacos folded up on themselves. And there can be up to two or three, correct? Up to four, actually. Up to four. Yeah. Female rays will mature from between four and six years old and give birth to live pups after one year of pregnancy. This ray is quite small for a pregnant female, and so it's possible she's not yet carrying pups. So I'm seeing no evidence of uh, juvenile rays within this adult female, so I think we're free to go ahead and put our tags in this fish, do our DNA clips, and take our blood samples. OK, I lost the vacuum on that one. Although this ray will not provide any reproductive data for Neil and his team, she can still provide important migratory data via her satellite tag and crucial DNA samples for genetic analysis. There we go. She's going to start to swim. Here she goes. The release of this spotted eagle ray concludes a scientific journey that has seen Neil and his team pushed to their absolute limits. Capturing these rays has not been easy, but working together, the team has succeeded. Fantastic. To see that fish swim away strongly into the current of Flats Inlet, just beautiful. These fish deserve our attention and our respect and understanding. If this population can continue to thrive in Bermuda, they can be ambassadors for the ocean. Good job, buddy. Teamwork makes the dream work. Since the filming of this program, the satellite tracking data has confirmed that these animals make no long-range migrations, but the DNA samples are a match to other eagle ray populations. The team's evidence suggests that millions of years ago, Bermuda must have been more accessible to this species. As the Earth's surface changed, so did the position of Bermuda. The result is a unique and precious population that moved with the island. The future of this species is bright, but one slip could see these glorious creatures disappear from these waters forever. Beautiful. The spotted eagle ray. Long may they reign. <laughs> Next time on Ocean Vet, Neil and his team enter the world of the tiger shark. They'll be tested to the limit as they try to install a satellite tagging computer to an 800-pound monster shark. 
and Neil and his team swim with these animals to see if there's any truth behind their reputation as ferocious man-eaters. This is Dr. Neil Burney. He lives in Bermuda, a stunning Atlantic island 640 miles east of North Carolina, USA. So now I'm leaving. Yeah. He spent the last 30 years practicing veterinary medicine, but now he's transferring his veterinary skills to help save, protect, and learn more about the incredible marine life of Bermuda's ocean. This is a completely wild shark. Alongside his dedicated ocean vet team are a number of scientists, yeah, this is here. marine this biologists, off the back fin. and specialist master divers, helping to perform a number of unique and dangerous procedures in a bid to safeguard critically important marine species. Together, the team will be fitting satellite tags to huge tiger sharks, saving precious green turtles, dissecting giant blue marlin, and obtaining unique toxin samples from 45-ton migrating humpback whales. Yay! Whoa! My knees are like jello. Yes, man. This is Bermuda, home to Dr. Neil Burney, the ocean vet. Tiger shark is one of the world's most powerful predators. Millions of years of evolution have seen this beautiful animal rise close to the top of the oceanic food chain. But this stature has come at a price. Local and international fishermen target this species, among others, for their fins and liver oil. Consequently, the tiger shark is now classified as near threatened. Just, you'll just support if I start to go. Sure, sure. The Ocean Vet team are coming to the end of an eight-year tiger shark research project. Little was known about this impressive predator. The project was established to tag and collect critical migratory data while learning more about this animal's behavior. These animals are absolutely spectacular. They're a hydrodynamic marvel and beautiful to watch. Neil and his team's research is helping local and international authorities establish shark protection policies. I got to be honest with you, I'm calling this possibly the biggest shark we've ever had. This thing is monstrous. In this episode, Neil and the crew struggle with an 800-pound tiger shark while attempting to fit its satellite tracking computer. Neil's unique set of veterinary skills are tested and the team's experience pushed to the limit. Trim up, Starboard please. Engine up. Starboard engine, trim it right up quick as you can. Go, 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 go. Under the water, the team risked their lives to learn more about tiger shark behavior while attempting to dispel the notion that these animals are mindless man-eaters. Okay, I'll pull it out from under. The final $6,000 satellite tag will provide the data needed for the government of Bermuda to establish a comprehensive shark conservation policy the first of its kind in Bermuda's long history. As Neil and the team prepares to embark on this epic adventure, Neil carefully checks the equipment needed to secure a huge tiger shark to the side of the boat. This is the sling in which we suspend our large tiger shark when we get into the side of the boat. It has to be adjustable both ways so that we can roll him rotationally to position his dorsal fin for drilling. We're going to take a measurement. Series marine biologist Choi Ming has been studying these sharks with Neil for over the last eight years and has made some interesting observations on their behavior in the wild. Now, obviously, we were cautious when we first jumped in, just uh, didn't, ha didn't have any idea what to expect. But over time, we've definitely seen that they're not the mindless eating machines that you think they are. In fact, when we're in the water, if you hold your ground and assert some dominance in the water column, not aggressively towards the animal, but you just hold your ground like you're a large predator, they'll keep their ground. And we've stayed in the water well over an hour on a couple occasions with multiple tiger sharks. So it just goes to show that once you understand the psychology of the animal, you can do a lot more than you think. Swimming with tiger sharks is dangerous. The team have had years of experience developing a unique understanding of shark behavior. 
Neil and Choi believe that by sharing their incredible interactions, they can change people's perception of tiger sharks and sharks in general. As always, Neil and Choi are supported by the rest of the Ocean Vet crew. Andrew Kirkpatrick is the underwater cameraman and doubles as underwater support during veterinary procedures. Dylan Ward and Neil's son, Oscar Dois, are the shark safety divers. Together, they ensure the safety of the team. The tiger shark tagging location is a 12-mile burn southwest of Bermuda to Challenger Bank. This seamount is one of two underwater volcanoes. It rises up from well over 2,000 feet and comes close to the surface at just under 180 feet. Before the team reach Challenger Bank, their journey is interrupted by something rather special. So as we're traveling through the deep oceans, we've come across a pod of bottlenose dolphin, and they're actually right in the bow with us. There's about 30 of them. We're going to try and see if we can get in the water and swim with them. These bottlenose dolphin are actually a specialized subspecies of deep diving dolphin. The dive patterns of these mammals correlate with vertical nightly migrations to over 6,500 feet. They hunt for prey on the steep-sided Bermuda pedestal. The opportunity to interact with such a subspecies is extremely rare. As always, Neil manages to do so in his own unique style. All right, sir. It's the first time I've used this fin in anger. This is uh, Lunacep Pro by Tenchi Miller. This thing makes you swim like a dolphin, and I swear, that dolphin, we think it was a big male, came in as if to say, what in heaven is that thing? Let me take a closer look. And he came right up, and then we swam across each other, and we swam together. It was uh, incredible, just man. So good. wicked. <laughs> it was exactly what I wanted to do with this fin. Humpbacks next year, this is going to be the deal. <laughs> With spirits high, the team switch gear back to tiger sharks. Choi is preparing the chum. So you can see Dylan and I here at the chum table, and basically we're making chum for the sharks. So what we have down here is a soup of uh, blood, guts, fish, just general nastiness. Now, the way we get a shark coming up is to actually attract them by sense of smell. Sharks have a fantastic sense of smell overall. Most sharks can detect about one drop of blood in a million drops of seawater. These animals track scent lines for hundreds of miles. In the wild, these lines usually direct the sharks to a feeding opportunity, more often than not a bait ball. Neil uses a slightly different payoff for when the sharks arrive. So this is a large blue marlin head. We get these from the sport fishing fleet, and the body of the fish hopefully gets used for some research, but the head becomes the centerpiece of our chum line. This is what the tiger sharks love to chew on, and when they're playing with this, they're less focused on us while we're swimming with them. So, Joy, let's get this in the water. Yeah. Three, two, one, one go! go. Once the head is in position, Neil jumps in and heads out to the marlin head. Tiger sharks are already in the area, attracted to the chum, but they're keeping their distance. To bring the sharks closer, Neil starts to scrape the marlin head with a knife. The sound travels through the water column and is picked up by the shark's lateral lines, a sensory system located along the side of the shark that converts movement and vibration into electrical impulse signals. Moments later, Neil spots a large tiger shark rising up from the deep. So while I was scraping the head, one of the sharks did come up and say hello, but he headed back down to the deep. So now I'm going to send this little chew toy down for him to play with and then hopefully bring him up to the surface where we can get in the water, swim, and observe the behavior of these animals up close. Neil's tried and tested methods have now brought multiple sharks right up to the marlin head. Their interest in the bait is now at the critical level. It's only once the sharks are engaged with the bait like this that Neil and Choi feel happy to enter the water. 
Okay, so in the last few moments, we've had three tiger sharks turn up in our chum line. So we're getting ready to get in the water and swim with them. Why would we want to get in the water and swim with three large tiger sharks? We want to observe their behavior, how they interact with one another. Very little research has been done on this, and we aim to increase that amount of knowledge. People think, is it dangerous? Well, if you appear to be dead, dying, or dumb, then you deserve to be on the tiger shark's menu. But we're going to act like other sharks. We're going to swim at them if they swim at us. We're going to show you that they're not to be feared, that they're to be respected. We want you to like these fish so you don't kill these fish. It's clear from the outset why Neil and Shoy enter the water during this period of high activity. Over the years, they have learned that the bait draws the attention of the sharks away from themselves, where most people would consider this to be the worst time to jump in. It is, in fact, by far the best. The animal's inquisitive nature allows Choi the opportunity to take some photographs. These will be cross-referenced against Neil and Choi's database of shark photos and enable the team to see which individuals are back in Bermuda from their oceanic migrations. Well, that was amazing. Uh, four large tiger sharks. One of them's obviously been hooked by somebody else, had a long leader and some spectral line coming off him. But what an amazing experience to see these sharks swimming close to us and to interact with not only with us, but with each other. Just amazing. Whew. Over years of observation, the Ocean Vet team have been able to unwrap some of the secrets of tiger sharks. These animals do show interest in Neil and Choi, but they also carefully watch one another. The animals make behavioral decisions based on the size and actions of other sharks in the area. As one feeds, others patiently wait their turn. By understanding this social order, the sharks accept Neil and Choi as other predators, enabling them to swim with the tigers in relative safety. Back on board, the team are reminded of how quickly things can go seriously wrong. The shark just took the, the, the buoy right under our starboard engine. He's in danger of breaking the lower unit off. The shark swims around and heads straight back towards Choi. Unbelievably, he jumps in. In this slow motion replay, you can just make out Choi's foot pushing the shark free of the engine. Choi is now some distance from the back of the boat. Disorientated and with no safety team, he's in danger. Sensing an opportunity, other sharks start to move towards Choi, following him right back to the boat, where he eventually manages to climb to safety. That was a big nine or 10 foot shark just dominating the scene with three others following in suit, almost bumping off each other. That was a fantastic encounter. So after a couple of hours of multiple tigers chewing on it, that 100 pound marlin head has been reduced to this, probably about eight pounds in weight. They've almost torn the chain right the way through the skull. And they also chewed through our rope and have nearly chewed through our 2,000 pound stainless steel cable. With so much shark activity, the team decide to push forward. Next, they'll attempt to catch one of these huge sharks to fit the final $6,000 satellite tracking computer. Neil lowers a single steel fishing line with a baited circle hook. It's not long before a tiger shark takes the bait. I think somebody's playing with this one. Oh, yeah, here we go. Tiger shark on! There is a serious risk of being pulled overboard when fighting such a huge fish. Neil uses a body harness to support his back, and Choi stands by to assist with additional weight. 
Uh, basically, I'm just bracing Neil. What happens is he's actually come from the back of the boat, so he's higher up on the step here, and obviously the uh, so his uh, center of gravity is a little bit higher, and also the shark's getting close to the boat, so he's getting a little more uh, a little more squirrely. Under the water, Kirkpatrick is watching the shark as it gets closer to the boat. The line has caught the shark at its tail and rolled him onto his back. The shark is now in tonic immobility, a trance-like state that sharks experience when upside down. Uh, we believe this fish may be tail wrapped as he was running straight away from the boat. The leader has caught around his tail, so we're bringing him in backwards. Yeah. Choi spots the shark break the surface. As it does, it triggers the shark's senses and suddenly rolls over and powers towards Dylan. OK, so this fish is taking a powerful run off into the distance right now. That's a serious run, man. Yeah, you Don't know what? a big guy on there. I didn't check this either. This is the rod that I lent to somebody else. I don't think it's running that direction right now, though. Andy. With the added concern that the equipment isn't in the best condition, Neil starts to regain some ground on the tiger shark. Unbeknown to the team, this tiger shark is the biggest shark they've ever encountered in Bermuda waters. You're going to have to loose the anchor briefly and let it go over my head. Try to cut up a bit. Is it good? Yeah. This is a big tiger shark. You can see what we mean with the tail wrap. He gets it on his tail and then comes in in this position. And you can see the huge claspers. It's a big boy. The first and most important task is to immobilize the shark's power using a strong but soft Good. tail rope. Good job, buddy. Neil and his team work quickly to rotate the shark so they can slide the harness around the animal and secure it to the side of the boat. But with a shark of this size, that's easier said than done. I got to be honest with you, I'm calling this possibly the biggest shark we've ever had. This thing is monstrous. I can tell you the weight when we measure it, but this is huge. With the shark now safe and secure, Neil and Choi can begin the tagging procedure. So we've assessed our shark. We think he's about 900 pounds, one of our largest tiger sharks that we have here in Bermuda. So we're going to fit him with our three battery extended life spot five tag. It's quite big tag. It's often used on the great whites, but it's not too big for this fish. He's a monster. These tags collect migratory data. Over the last eight years, a number of tiger sharks have been tracked all over the Atlantic Ocean. These tracks have revealed Bermuda to be a key habitat showing individuals returning year on year. This is the crucial information the team need to help protect the species in Bermuda. Back on the boat, Neil and Choi have the last sat tag in place. Um, well, basically, we're putting the satellite tag as high on the fin as possible so that the antenna reaches up. We're bolting through. The tag's on one side. We have a washer and a lock knot. And we have plastic bolts so that it doesn't rust in the animal. Just all whole thing about animal safety. And we'll snip them off and make it as streamlined as possible so it affects the swimming at a minimum. Yeah, this is a huge fish. Yeah, I think so. To secure these tags, Neil has drilled small holes through the animal's dorsal fin. This looks distressing, but sharks have very few nerve endings in this part of their body. It is a relatively painless procedure and a very small price for this one shark to pay for the benefit of its entire species. I just think it's tragic how many sharks are being killed needlessly for their fins, for game fish, for sport, just for putting their teeth on a wall. And we don't understand enough about the migratory patterns of these fish. And this study is going to allow us to learn so much more about how far these fish travel and their fact that they are truly international migrants. So you can see the tag nicely right at the dorsal fin, right at the top. So when he comes to the surface, that antenna is going to come out. This point of the shark tag will dry, and that will tell it to transmit. I'm going to trim away the surplus plastic, being careful not to throw it in the ocean, where it would add to the plastic pollution that we're already dealing with. The shark has been in Neil and Choi's care for just over 10 minutes well under the 20 minute release target. Now the tag is in place, Choi is able to move in and collect the information required to complete the data package. Excellent. Cool, 10 foot one. All right, so it was 10 foot one overall, which puts it in about the 750 pound range in terms of sharks. And to the end of the tail, it was about 12 foot four. 
10 foot sharks are usually in the area of about 15 years old. So this guy's been around for a while. Judging by the size of his claspers, I'm sure he's reproducing. The team are now preparing for the shark's release. Neil's veterinary skills are key to this final step. The shark is tired and will need Neil's assistance to swim free. Over the course of this project, Neil and the team have successfully released all their sharks, but as this is the last one, the pressure is on to get it right. So, I'm just gonna check his nictitating membrane to make sure he's vigorous, and I'm gonna look at how he's breathing. The nictitating membrane test is a simple reflex examination. The shark's protective eye cover closes upon Neil's gentle touch. This is a good indication of how alert the shark is and enables Neil to predict how the shark will behave once the straps are released. Nictitating membrane is good, came straight over his eye. Neil then checks to see if the shark has flow over its gills. Again, this indicates how alert the shark will be when it's set free. And he's gulping water, so he looks good. I'm happy. These fish are so vital to the marine ecosystem. I'm delighted that we've been able to capture this guy, have him in good shape, and we're going to let him go. I'm going to wish him well on his journey. And hopefully, we're going to change the impression that the only good shark is a dead shark. Neil carefully uses large bolt cutters to remove the hook. There is inevitably a small amount of blood, but nothing that won't heal quickly. Hook is clear. All right. Finally, they release the sling. Neil takes hold of the shark okay. and begins to swim this massive predator away from the boat and back down into the ocean. Since the filming of this project, the Bermuda Department of Fisheries has received a comprehensive map of over 100 tiger shark migrations. As a result, the Department of Fisheries is developing its first comprehensive tiger shark conservation strategy, a policy that will hopefully protect all of Bermuda's sharks throughout the island's 200-mile exclusive economic zone. This shark, named Andy, is again free to roam the open ocean. Uh, that fish was a bit slow to start. I gave him a push for about 20 meters, and then I could feel him start to kick. And then he started to kick away, and I actually went down with him. And he decided, no, he wanted to come back up. He came back up and swam away just at the surface. Some tiger sharks like to cruise the surface. This one did. Woo! Next time on Ocean Vet, Neil and the team delve deep into the world of the mighty blue marlin. Sure he's gonna hold him up, I'm gonna plop the tag. After hours at sea on a mission to protect this species, they successfully place the first of many satellite tags. That's it, the tag is in, the B-side tag is deployed in this fish. Back on land, they receive a massive blue marlin from the Marlin World Cup and prepare to perform the first ever televised dissection of an Atlantic blue marlin. So here's the swim bladder. We can actually remove it from the fish. The team's goal is to reveal the anatomical secrets of this remarkable ocean giant. This is Dr. Neil Burney. He lives in Bermuda, a stunning Atlantic island 640 miles east of North Carolina, USA. So now the, yeah. He spent the last 30 years practicing veterinary medicine but now he's transferring his veterinary skills to help save, protect, and learn more about the incredible marine life of Bermuda's ocean. This is a completely wild shark. Alongside his dedicated ocean vet team are a number of scientists, yeah, this and marine biologists, off the back fin. and specialist master divers, helping to perform a number of unique and dangerous procedures in a bid to safeguard critically important marine species. Together, the team will be fitting satellite tags to huge tiger sharks, saving precious green turtles, 
dissecting giant blue marlin and obtaining unique toxin samples from 45-ton migrating humpback whales. Yay! Whoa! My knees are like jello. Yes, man. This is Bermuda, home to Dr. Neil Burney, the ocean vet. These glorious waters off the coast of Bermuda are home to one of the most coveted game fish species in the world, the giant blue marlin. The blue marlin is the largest of the Atlantic marlins and one of the biggest fish in the world. Native to tropical and temperate waters, the blue marlin is among some of the most recognizable of all fish. Joey's gonna hold him up, I'm gonna plop the tag. In this incredible episode, Neil and the Ocean Vet team are on a scientific mission to satellite tag one of these powerful animals. Their aim is to collect marlin movement data and provide the information to an international billfish conservation project. We've decided that although blue marlin fishing requires a great deal of patience, we haven't got quite enough. After several grueling hours at sea, the team's luck changes when a sports fishing boat decides to hand over a huge blue marlin for the tagging procedure. This fish is gonna swim, man. He's the dorsal's up, he's gonna swim, I tell you. On occasions, these monster fish are caught and killed in fishing competitions. Utilizing the body of one such fish and Neil's unique veterinary skills, the team will also be dissecting and studying the anatomy of these incredible animals. 573 pounds of blue marlin. What a magnificent fish this is. Together with unique tracking data to support this animal's conservation and the body of a marlin donated to the Ocean Vet team for research, this episode reveals the very makeup of Bermuda's famous blue marlin. So the blue marlin is considered by many to be the ultimate sport fish. Requires serious gear because its powerful runs can strip a reel of line in no time. This is a large bait that we use. We troll this behind the boat. And the reel here is capable of exerting massive amounts of drag uh, so that we can tire the fish out. Hopefully we tire the fish out before we tire me out. Catching one of these huge fish for tagging will not be easy. Choi Ming, the series marine biologist, Andrew Kirkpatrick, the team's underwater videographer, Dylan Ward, the team's fisherman, and Oscar Doyce, the second boat captain, will all be working together to bring a blue marlin to the side of the boat. So at first glance, you may think that this is a fairly large law, but you have to consider that a 1,000-pound blue marlin is entirely capable of eating a 200-pound yellowfin tuna in one Bite. The Atlantic blue marlin are under intense fishing pressure. In the Caribbean alone, Japanese and Cuban fishermen annually take over a thousand tons of this fish. All right, we're on it. Just watch the tag on the floor. Yeah, on this side. Neil and his team's goal is to satellite tag a Bermuda blue marlin. The tag data will be sent to the Billfish Research Project and shared with fishery policymakers to help protect billfish species like the blue marlin from overfishing. It's one thing about marlin fishing, we've always got to look at how these lures are working. Captains and mates will obsess about the action of these different lures, saying this lure works better in this condition, this lure works better in another sea state. Personally, I think as long as it throws bubbles and a marlin's hungry, he's going to eat it. The team have been fishing the deep sides of Challenger Bank for several hours. Several other large sports fishing boats are also fishing around Bermuda's banks. In an attempt to increase the team's chances of tagging a blue marlin, Dylan puts out a radio message offering a thousand dollars to any boat that transfers a large blue to the team. It looks like their plan may have worked. Although blue marlin fishing requires a great deal of patience, we haven't got quite enough. Another boat has hooked up a blue, and we are going to go and take that blue, transfer it to this boat, and put a PSAT tag in it. So we're pulling all our lines in, 
and we're heading over to the other boat right now. Neil opens the throttles on each of the 250 horsepower engines, hurtling the ocean vet boat over the ocean at 50 miles an hour, straight towards the sports fishing boat Marlin Fever. En route, more information comes over the radio. They might kill it. They've already got his boat side. They've already got his boat side. It sounds like the animal may be killed as a contender for the Bermuda Marlin World Cup. The Marlin World Cup is held in Bermuda each year and has a 98% release ratio. But if a Marlin is large enough, it may be killed for a top prize. However, the World Cup donates hundreds of thousands of dollars to conservation projects established to ensure the number of these fish now and in the future. Yeah, look at his dorsal going up. All right. In total, sport represents only 1% of blue marlin mortality, and all fish killed are eaten or donated for scientific research. Snap swivel is coming. Gab a pentin bottle as a fat. Back in the action, Neil and the team have reached Marlin Fever, and the fish is still alive. All right, so uh, Marlin Fever is going to donate their blue to us. We're going to give them our snap swivel. We're going to take over the fish. We are going to land it on bones, and we're going to put a piece out archival tag in it. What would you like to call it? Well, well, we'll call you back on the dock. You can tell us what you want to call the fish, and we'll get your email so we can send you guys the track and everything. Yeah. Choi has now transferred Neil's fishing line to Marlin Fever, where their crew have attached it to the leader hook to the fish. Good, let him go. Neil now has control of this blue marlin. So we now have a blue marlin on the line. We're going to bring him over to our boat. We're going to leader him on our boat, and we're going to put a piece of that archival tag in this fish, and we're going to track it around the ocean. And she's, he's swimming right now. I can feel him pulsing below me right here. In the background, the ocean vet team are scrambling to ready the boat and equipment needed to handle this fish. The blue marlin is under the boat, making slow circles, swimming strongly. We're just getting our team organized. OK, now I want you to idle forwards, keeping the fish on the port side of the boat. Once the animal is at the surface and within reach, Dylan quickly inserts the water hoses to pump oxygen over the animal's gills. I can see the color returning to this fish as we're pumping this oxygenated water over his gills. It really seems to be doing a great job of reviving him. I'm going to jump in the rib. We're going to put the tag in this fish and let him go. Just watch the tag on the floor. Time is now of the essence. The welfare of this animal is Neil and the team's top priority. Stress can easily kill these gigantic fish. I'm ready to place the tag. I've pre-made the hole. You ready? Bring him in a little closer. Tag is placed. Check it. Tag is placed. And firmly check. That's it. The tag is in. Peace out. Tag is deployed in this fish. Good luck, buddy. I'm going to jump overboard. Next, Neil jumps in to prepare for the release. Neil, what's happening? This fish is going to swim, man. His dorsal's up. He's going to swim, I tell you. OK, let it go. I think you can release it. In six months, the tag will drop off this fish and transmit its data to satellites hundreds of miles above. The tag on this fish, among others, is providing the data needed to legislate protection and enhance conservation for this economically and ecologically important species. has tagged and released the blue marlin out here on Bermuda's Challenger Bank exactly as we'd hoped to do so. And the good news is we didn't have to spend six days ourselves fishing for it. Woo! Patience is a virtue, but sometimes the impatient actually can do better. Right? Yeah. Next, the ocean vet team are preparing to dissect a 573-pound blue marlin. So it's the morning of our dissection. We're here at the Spanish Point Boat Club. And we have a large blue marlin. We're going to open this fish up and see exactly the internal anatomy of this amazing marine giant. Choi Ming, hey. Oscar Doyce, and Dylan Ward are our team. It's going to take all of us to cut this fish apart. 
This marlin has been killed for sport in the Bermuda Marlin World Cup, an international sports fishing competition. Although initially concerning, it's important to understand that sports fishermen donate hundreds of thousands of dollars to major conservation and research projects. Fortunately, my wife is off island at present and does not realize that her favorite kitchen knives are gonna be used for cutting up this rather large fish. Neil and the team will be dissecting this fish in an attempt to show how much of an evolutionary miracle this species really is. Rather than it being served up, the team are seizing an opportunity to educate and share its impressive secrets. Neil believes that by increasing the public's understanding of this species, it's possible to inspire greater conservation. Wow, check the size of this fish. She is incredible. Over 500, so yeah, you're right. It's definitely a she. Definitely a female. 573 pounds of blue marlin. What a magnificent fish this is. So Choi, what, what do we think the function is of this massive bill on this fish? Well, these guys love to um, they go in as schools of uh, prey fish. And what they do is they'll charge right in and they'll actually slash back and forth, almost like a sword fighter with a sword. And they're hoping to uh, injure, damage, you know, even kill the fish right there. And then they go ahead and eat it. And not only that, they've, uh, they've actually skewered fish in the past. And in fact, there's one local fisherman, Ian Card, was transfixed by one, a bill on a fish bigger than this, apparently, which took him right through under the collarbone. And the fish took him out of the boat, 30 feet down under the water, he was lucky to survive. The fish never touched the boat. 30 feet through the air, six feet above water, took a 180 pound guy out of the boat. Yeah, I've heard that story and it's, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. The marlin's agility and extraordinary power has evolved over thousands of years to ensure that the animal can successfully hunt. This agility and power is provided by massive muscle groups that run down each side of the animal's body. These muscles are on the front line of ensuring the animal's survival. Removing and revealing these muscle groups is the team's first step to understanding how this animal's body functions. So Choi's making his first cut along the lateral line of this fish. We're gonna to try to remove the dorsal fillet, the main muscle group running down the back of this fish in one or two pieces. I'm gonna join him, I'm gonna cut from here, and my cut's gonna join his, I'm gonna remove this muscle. The animal has two types of muscle that have evolved to support different swimming behavior. Neil has taken a sample of the combined muscle to the inspection mat for a closer look. So here we have the loin of our marlin. I'm gonna cut right through it here and show you the two different muscle masses. This is his anaerobic, his fast twitch muscle. This is what gives him his huge amount of power. As this contracts either side of his spine and flexes him, it generates a rear-facing wave of motion which powers him out of the water. Tail walks, spectacular. He can pull a 12-ton fishing boat backwards through the water. This, on the other hand, is his red muscle, which allows this fish to travel thousands of kilometers looking for food without burning any energy. As we released our fish, he swam away on this muscle. This was not tired. This muscle was shattered. Blue marlin are able to recover from extreme spells of exhaustion and travel thousands of miles by switching between their different muscle types. Feeding both these muscle groups with vital oxygen is the job of the animal's huge gills. Choi and Neil have removed the protective gill plate to take a closer look. So yesterday we had a fish alongside the boat and we put a tag in it. What we were very careful to do was when we slowed the boat down, we put two hoses into the mouth of this fish and we sent oxygenated water from our pumps straight over the gills of this fish. And that mimicked absolutely the movement of a fish at several miles an hour through the water. These fish can ventilate enough for their slow twitch muscles when they're moving at one or two miles an hour. But when they're moving fast, they generate way more oxygenation and that's what we mimicked with our hoses. Oxygen is actually pulled out of the water by the gills 
and it actually transfers through little filaments right into the bloodstream. And these are very, very fine structures. Blood passes against seawater within about a millionth of a meter, one micron. So it's a very, very tiny area. And there's actually about eight of them here times two sides. That's a huge amount of surface area that it actually has in a compact space to pick up oxygen out of the water. So you can see, even though this is a small structure, it is enough surface area to grab oxygen for a fish this size. Oxygen is the key to the animal's overall function but so is the energy created from its food. The marlin's eyes are its secret weapon when it comes to finding this food. The function of the eyes have an incredible secret. Neil and Choi have removed the armor plating around the organ to find out more. So now that we've cut away the bony portion at the back of the orbit here, we can reveal the muscles that attach to this tough eyeball. Yeah, and right here, yeah, right where your finger is, I can see perfectly what's referred to as the thermogenic organ. And the thermogenic organ is effectively um, some extraocular eye muscles that sit in the back. And over time, what has happened is they have uh, evolved less in terms of the uh, contractile myofilaments, mm -hmm. and they've increased in the number of uh, mitochondria, producing more ATP. So that generates a whole lot of heat. So basically, not very much elasticity or strength, but a whole lot of heat generating behind this eyeball. So we have central heating for this fish's eyeball. Exactly. And not only that, but the blood also runs into the retina. It's warm. The eye works way better when the fish is down a mile deep in the cold, cold water of the deep abyss. He can still see, the other fish can't, so he's got the upper hand. Also, his brain is receiving a blood vessel from this same heater organ. So he's got a warm brain. He doesn't get cold, he doesn't get hypothermia, he's cooking. Yeah. The internal heating system in this otherwise cold-blooded animal allows the fish to spot prey effectively in cold, deep water. In order to reach this deep, cold water, the marlin uses its swim bladder, a special organ that allows the animal to quickly move up and down through the vast water column. This is fascinating, man, look at this. We've got the swim bladder sitting here, and I believe we've got the rest of the organs located right down beneath it, right here. So here's the swim bladder. We can actually remove it from the fish. This is filled in a remarkable way. Oxygen is drawn from the bloodstream into the bladder to increase the buoyancy and bring the marlin up in the water column. In fact, anglers have seen marlin with their dorsal and tail out of the water, floating right at the surface. Then, when he needs to, oxygen can be returned to the depleted blood here at the rear of the swim bladder, reducing its buoyancy and allowing the fish to sink down, much in the same way that a diver would use a BCD, a buoyancy control device, to move up and down in the water column. The main skeletal element inside the marlin is the vertebral column. Similar to a human spine, it's composed of multiple vertebrae. In the case of the marlin, the vertebrae are considerably different. I'm good on this end. It's just that side that needs a little... little and bit. here we have it. And what you may be able to see here, it's difficult to see, but the actual vertebral body is here, and here, and here. And yet the spinous processes are separated by some two inches on either side. So basically, we've got an interlocking vertebral body system which gives this fish this flexibility and yet this rigidity. So when those big powerful muscles pull this fish from side to side, it's like a spring driving him through the water and powering him into the air. Neil and Choi have revealed some of the blue marlin's impressive anatomy and shared a few of its truly remarkable features. Features that have enabled this fish to thrive throughout our planet's oceans. But one part of the marlin's anatomy has evolved above all others. The blue marlin's tail. So we've seen how the muscle and the vertebral column generate the power that goes to the tail. Here it is, the most efficient oscillating propeller that we know. This, when driven through the water, can produce speeds of over 40 miles an hour for this fish and throw it 30 feet through the air. Guess what? 
I have almost an exact replica, and this is the latest modern computer design foil for my windsurfer. Look how remarkably similar it is to what nature has achieved after natural evolution has occurred over millions of years. The Marlin had it right all along. A variable aspect foil, brilliant in design. Dissecting an animal like this has provided me with a unique opportunity to learn more about this creature. Like so many marine species, they are often out of sight, out of mind. This has reaffirmed to me why we work so hard to protect all marine species. They deserve our attention. They have developed into such remarkable creatures. Neil and the team continue to work with the sports fishing community and plan to tag more blue marlin in the coming years. I'm ready to place the tag. Okay. The tag on this fish revealed the marlin traveled 300 miles north of Bermuda. It was likely following the Gulf Stream's temperature gradient. This cold and warm water meeting point tends to accumulate marine life. It's highly likely this blue marlin was in pursuit of food. I think you can release it. Sadly, the tag malfunctioned and popped off just after this journey. Consequently, no long-range migration was recorded. Neil and the team will be continuing their work to gather more data, data that will ultimately help protect this species long into the future. Next time on Ocean Vet, Neil and the team join the Bermuda Turtle Project, helping to collect vital data in a bid to improve the numbers of green sea turtles around the world. He actually looks in pretty good shape. Neil will also be rescuing sick green sea turtles from Bermuda's beaches to rehabilitate and release them back into the wild. We wish this guy all the best. He has a tough road ahead as he continues on his epic journey. Good luck, little one. This is Dr. Neil Burney. He lives in Bermuda, a stunning Atlantic island 640 miles east of North Carolina, USA. So now I'm yeah. He spent the last 30 years practicing veterinary medicine, but now he's transferring his veterinary skills to help save, protect, and learn more about the incredible marine life of Bermuda's ocean. This is a completely wild shark. Alongside his dedicated ocean vet team, are a number of scientists, yeah, this and here, marine this biologists, off the back fin. and specialist master divers, helping to perform a number of unique and dangerous procedures in a bid to safeguard critically important marine species. Together, the team will be fitting satellite tags to huge tiger sharks, saving precious green turtles, dissecting giant blue marlin, and obtaining unique toxin samples from 45-ton migrating humpback whales. Yay! Whoa! My knees are like jello. Yes, man. This is Bermuda, home to Dr. Neil Burney, the ocean vet. The green sea turtle is one of the most recognized and loved reptiles in all of the world's oceans. Like many marine species, these turtles are under threat. Poachers, pollution, and fishing nets are all factors that have placed this animal on the endangered species list. Hey, hi, Peter. Jennifer, great to see you. In this episode, Neil and the Ocean Vet crew will be working alongside the Bermuda Turtle Project performing a number of unique procedures to monitor the health and population dynamics of Bermuda's juvenile green sea turtles. It's right there. Neil will also be working with the Bermuda Aquarium's Turtle Stranding Unit to recover, rehabilitate, and re-release injured turtles back into the wild. Finally, Neil and Choi will attach a satellite tracking tag to a larger, more mature green turtle in a bid to gather unique data which is vital to support the ongoing conservation and protection of this internationally loved species. Neil and his ocean vet team have been invited to assist the Bermuda Turtle Project by project leader Jennifer Gray a lady who has dedicated most of her life to the study and conservation of green sea turtles. To close off the circle, so... She is supported by doctors Peter and Ann Malin, 
the project's scientific directors and veterans of the Bermuda Turtle Project. Peter! Hey, great to see you. Annie, great, great to, to have see you out here today. Ah, oh. Excellent, been a while. <laughs> Jennifer, <laughs> what are we going to be doing today? Catching lots of turtles now. You guys ready? Can't wait. Excellent. So, who are all the participants here? Can we have a list of names quickly? Who's who? Start from here. I'm Alice. This international mix of participants will assist with the capture of the turtles. This process is quite straightforward. A large, deep net is used to encircle an area of seagrass beds inhabited by the turtles. As the turtles try to escape, they swim into the soft netting. So these are all our course participants, and it's our job to get the turtles to the surface as soon as they enter the net. We're going to then bring them back to endurance and work them up. And hopefully, one of them will be big enough that we'll be able to put a satellite tag on it. Right, right? Yeah. yeah. Satellite tag data, along with DNA and blood research, is enabling this project to build a visual web of migratory paths, populations, and breeding sites, helping to improve the worldwide conservation of this beautiful reptile. So we've got the turtle that swam into the net, brought it to the surface. Liana is disentangling it from the net, and I'm giving the hand signal to the boat so that they know we have one to be picked up. Choi Aming, Neil's right-hand man and series marine biologist, is on the capture boat with Jennifer Gray, collecting the retrieved turtles. OK, so Neil is dead ahead, and he's got another turtle. And there's also about four or five others that some of the other participants have. So turtles everywhere. We've got to get this guy in the boat as quick as possible. I'm not, I'm not sure how many times we see this. I think it's only ocean vet, where one has wrapped around the other one. So this is definitely uh, a boat disentanglement here. Yeah. OK. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So for every one of these guys, there should be 99 more in the ocean, and we've taken them out. So we've got to do everything we can to preserve all these green turtles, because this is the last of them. Retrieving these turtles is no easy task. Constantly entangling them, then holding them at the surface is challenging. These reptiles can weigh in excess of 20 kilos. So it requires quite a bit of teamwork to get these bigger turtles out of the net. But Joy, if you can grab it. Yeah. This actually may be a candidate for our satellite tag. It's quite a large turtle. Yeah. So far, we've been out all of about 10 or 15 minutes, and we've got nine turtles in the boat, and we still got a few more to grab. We've seen a few swimming around, darting in the uh, sand. So good haul thus far, and we're probably only about halfway through. Even the smaller turtles can present a challenge. Having the capture boat close by ensures the welfare and safety of every turtle. All right, great guys. This guy's a little too entangled for me, so I'm going to pass him up to you guys. Okay. Right. Luckily, he's small enough. Oh, I can just pull the whole thing out. Okay, buddy. So, that little turtle was a little too badly entangled for me to get him out whilst he's in the water. So we simply bring him onto the capture boat, and Choi and Cameron are going to disentangle him. I'm just going to wet down the rest of our turtles, keep them nicely cool while they're waiting in the capture boat, to get back to the endurance. All right, this is our smallest guy yet. Isn't he cute? So we're just going to stick him in the back. And a beautiful small specimen. Fantastic. There you go, you got it nice. Yep. Come on. Green sea turtles are air breathers, so being out of the water is not harmful to them. By cushioning the turtles on these foam noodles, Neil and the team ensure they remain calm and secure during the tagging and sampling procedures. So, every turtle that comes on board gets scanned with this microchip scanner. This is exactly the same one that I use at my vet practice, and Michaela has seen these at Endsmeat, because we use these on the dogs and cats. So, we're going to scan this animal, and we're going to scan this left flipper, and we're going to see if there's a tag in it. And this one doesn't have one. We're going to keep moving around the group. We're going to come to this one. Ah, here we go. We can now go and find the details of when this animal was chipped previously, what its history was, and what its tag number was that it shed. Because it's obviously lost the external tag that was applied at the same time as the pit tag. So 14 yeah. August yeah, so 2007, she was marked. Yeah. 
14th of August 2007, almost seven years ago, and she's back here. And I say she with impunity, right? Because she's been sent. Well, I have to, I have to look at the database to tell you. Oh, okay. All right. We don't have that in that. Some of the turtles don't have the microchips installed. So after fitting some new external fin tags, Neil and Peter implant new microchips. So we've got a perfect ID number that's unique to this animal. It means researchers can find this. Fishermen will be able to identify this creature by simply reading this tag. You seeing these here, John? Do these look like healed yeah. bite marks to bite you? Marks. They do, don't they? Yeah. Neil, so. Neil around? Choi yeah. and Jennifer spot signs of injury to one of the turtle's flippers, so Neil comes in to assess the animal. I think there's one more on the front as well, man. So if we compare this rear flipper to the yeah. one on the turtle next to him, you can see there's two quite clear semicircular indentations where pieces of tissue have been removed and have then healed over. Yeah. And the same on his back flipper here, two discrete bite marks and then something from the front also. It's common for these turtles to sustain injuries as they grow up in the waters around Bermuda. Predators such as Galapagos sharks and even much larger tiger sharks are known to feed on these turtles. Anyway, he seems to be none the worse for it, and it's obviously he's able to swim fine. It's just a little bit of an interesting. Uh, They've healed really nicely. Yeah. yeah. These turtles can weigh up to 180 kilos or 400 pounds when mature. Weighing them is an important part of monitoring their health. Okay, so we've just strapped in our turtle. You can see we've got a rope on each fin. We've just put him into the scale. You can see he hangs quite nicely, seems reasonably relaxed. We're just waiting for the scale to get a reading on his exact weight. So this guy is about 21.6 kilograms, yeah. So that's a good size animal. They're solid little guys. Next, Neil needs to take some blood. So we're just preparing this turtle to have blood samples drawn for DNA analysis and for sexing purposes. There it is. That's blood. sufficient. Just a little more. Just a little more. There's all our DNA that we need. Plenty. We'll put that blue lid on there. These DNA samples will be compared with that of other international green sea turtle populations. If there's a match, then the turtle project can determine what region that specific juvenile green turtle has come from to reach Bermuda. A lot of blood to spend. Today. Sure, sure. Now that the blood samples have been taken, Choi, Robert, and some of the other participants are processing them in the onboard lab. Now, you can see there's a slight color variant as I pull these out. Uh, these more yellowish tinged serums here they're from older turtles, and the thinking is it's a pigment from all the seagrass that they're eating, so that's kind of neat. So the younger turtles have a clear serum, and the older turtles have uh, sort of a, a yellowish serum to them. Okay, oh, that's a much more clear sample. So if you look at these two, you can see that one is a lot lighter. That's probably from a younger turtle, and that yellowish stuff, those are the pigments from the seagrass that we were speaking about. Once the blood sampling is complete and the serum is extracted, Neil is ready to release these turtles back into the wild. So we've had a great day here at Somerset Long Bay. We've got a whole lot of turtles that we've worked up and we're getting ready to release them. We've kept one back because we're gonna put that satellite tag on that one creature. It's been a wonderful project no, over, the last, over yeah. the last 40 years, this study has been going on and it's providing data that not only protects these turtles here in Bermuda, but throughout their Caribbean range. Right. So I'm gonna get into the water and uh, we're gonna get these guys released and let them right. swim away. The research that's been conducted today will make a huge difference in the fight to preserve green sea turtle populations, not just in Bermuda, but all over the world. That was the last one, they're all gone. Good yeah, work. That was excellent. Great, Troy. Yeah. That was really good. All the turtles got released. We collected a whole bunch of data. It was a fantastic day all around. Great success for Ocean Vet and the Bermuda Turtle Project. Thanks, so buddy. great job, guys. Awesome. There we go. It's like a nursery. The Turtle Project is not alone in its battle to save this species. 
Neil is assisting another project which helps ensure the survival of Bermuda's green sea turtles. This is the turtle exhibit at the Bermuda Aquarium Museum and Zoo. And these two girls were actually hatched here on the sand beach you can see behind me. There is also a wildlife rehabilitation center here at the aquarium where injured or sick turtles are brought for their recovery. The Bermuda Turtle Project works hard to ensure the health of green turtles in Bermuda, but sadly some are injured by the ingestion of plastic, ingestion of other toxins, or even being injured by boats. They're brought here and when they're recovered, they're released back into the wild. So it's somewhere on this beach. Oh yeah, there it is. It's right there. Neil is working with Patrick from the Turtle Stranding Network. Yeah, they said it was under the mangrove. They're responding to a call reporting a turtle that's been washed up on Gibbets oh, yeah. Beach, not far from the aquarium. Cool. What's that? So, little green, right? Yep. Little green. Wow. All right, let me go get the tub, Looks all right? Yeah, sure, man. All right, Patrick, you go get the tub and we'll get this guy back to the aquarium. All right, cool. Be right back. Green. All right, let me just see. So the first thing we're going to do is assess for any type of external injuries on this animal, see if he's been hit by a boat, if he's got any prop damage. I'm going to just take him into the ocean. I'm going to carry him. I'm going to rinse him off. This is one of uh, many thousands of immature green turtles who spend their time here as they're growing up. And on my first exam, the great news is his carapace has not been injured. We quite commonly see prop cuts all the way through the shell, right the way through into the internal organs. This animal is not damaged. And again, so we look at his ventral surface, we look at his plastron, and his plastron is also intact. Hi, baby. He actually looks in pretty good shape. The only thing I would say is he's pretty quiet for a little green turtle. Normally, they'd be fighting me and trying to get away. He's maybe, he's maybe a little excessively buoyant. Yeah, he's floating a little too high. He should be able to be neutral to be able to pull himself down and sit on the bottom. And this guy's floating with a large part of his back out of the water. So he may have an accumulation of gas in his abdomen. He may have eaten something that's blocking his intestines. And so the gas is not escaping. So we're going to get him over to the aquarium and we'll get Dr. Ian Walker, who's the curator there. We'll get him to do a full and thorough examination of this turtle and we'll see if we can help him out. So yeah, if we want to get him up on a table, once we're gloved, I can do that. Dr. Ian Walker is chief curator at the Aquarium Museum and Zoo and has years of experience working with a myriad of different species, including right. turtles. Just hit that light for me. After a routine physical fast. examination and x-ray, he has a suspicion of what the problem with this turtle might be. What we have right here is the trachea coming down and then breaking in the two, uh, two primary bronchi. Just like you or I. Exactly, yep. exactly. Um, now, interestingly enough, their lungs aren't sitting in a sort of, in the thorax, they don't have a diaphragm, so it's just sitting there in their salamic cavity. Um, and consequently, if they get overinflated, they float. But this right. is actually a normal reaction for sea turtles in the wild. So a sea turtle in the wild, when it's in trouble, will overinflate its lungs as a way of bringing it to the surface so that it can rest at the surface. That way, it doesn't have to expend effort every time it comes to the surface to breathe. Because remember, these are obligate air breathers. They have to be up there. Yeah, we've seen turtles like this before. And our current theory is that they've probably ingested too much uh, jellyfish. Uh, so some of the nematocysts, well, they're getting a lot of nematocysts. These are the stinging cells right. from the jellyfish, are in their intestines, constantly stinging them and constantly delivering venom into their system. A little bit, so we'll see. We're going to just slide that in gently, so we're sliding it into the cloaca. Dr. Walker decides to perform an enema on the turtle to see if he can gather a sample of the stinging cells. Wow, so this is a nematocyst. This is what you're expecting to see? Yeah, this is exactly based on the clinical signs of this animal. This is exactly what we thought we might see in this fecal. So it's proven this animal's eaten probably a jellyfish, uh, and presumably there's a lot more of these in the intestine. These nematocysts, when we look at them like this, we can see everything's coiled up inside them. It's really like a jack-in-a-box where the head of the jack-in-a-box is jammed inside the spring. And as the spring comes out, everything turns inside out like this. And then right at the end of it, there's a stinging needle with a bunch of venom in it. So if these things unload inside the turtle, they poison the turtle from the inside. Hopefully, 
This little turtle, after a few days under the care of Patrick, Roma, and Ian, is going to recover and hopefully we'll get a chance to release it back into the wild. This little turtle will remain at the Bermuda Aquarium Museum and Zoo until it's fully recovered. Neil will return later to release it back into the wild. Next up, Neil and Choi are back working with the Bermuda Turtle Project to fit a satellite tag to the shell of one of the larger green turtles they collected earlier. So the value of this type of tag is immense. Not only will it tell us the day-to-day hour-to-hour movements of this turtle on and off his feeding site to his resting sites when he may be at risk crossing major boat channels. But also, if this turtle does go on his long-term migration, then we may be able to see what route this turtle uses to return towards the nesting site where he originated. The conservation of these turtles is truly an international venture, and that's what the Bermuda Turtle Project is all about. Okay, so this is the satellite tag, and it's the exact same company and exact same technology that we use on our tiger sharks. It's just a different model, so it can attach to a turtle shell, just like that. And this antenna here, what it will do is every time the turtle surfaces, it will relay data to a satellite, and we will get real-time movements on where this turtle is. So we will be able to track him, almost as if he had a cell phone. Okay, looking good, I think. So yeah. we're almost ready to apply the tag. Pretty much got so rid Robert, of all I the think ridges. we'll let you do the honors for this. Yeah. And uh, here, I think you want to make a little ridge on the front, so I'll just keep the chopstick at the ready. All right. Just give it a nice squeeze down. Get it good and seated in the epoxy. So we're making sure that we have a nice, smooth attachment between the shell and the tag. With the tag firmly bonded to the turtle's shell, it's time for Neil and the team to release this beautiful animal back into the ocean. So after an epic day here, tagging and recording data from turtles, we're now going to let this girl go. We've named her Kirsty, And we're going to hope that this animal will actually leave Bermuda and go on its developmental migratory path, and we can follow this animal to some destination in the Caribbean. Who knows where? I'm going to get in the water and make sure she swims away strongly. Well, I'll take her and try to hold her upright, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just make sure she's comfortable in the water. Takes a few breaths. Okay. Just take the weight on the back for a sec until there. Perfect. Nice. All right. Good grip. So I'm just going to wait for her to take a good breath, and then I'm going to let her go. The release of this turtle marks the beginning of a research project which will have far wider reaching ramifications than the distance this turtle will travel in its lifetime. And it will help ensure the continued research and conservation of its entire species. Wow, so she took off like a rocket. As soon as I let her go, gone, out of sight, right? Wicked. <laughs> By working with these animals, Neil and his team have helped to ensure that green sea turtles are protected not just in Bermuda, but all over the world. These animals have a critical role in the ocean's marine ecosystem. By gathering samples and tagging these turtles, Neil and his team have ensured the continued fight for this animal's survival. Back at the aquarium, Neil and Choi have received good news about the sick turtle rescued earlier. So this is the little turtle that we brought into wildlife rehab a few days ago, and he's fully recovered from the ingestion of those poisonous jellyfish stinging cells. It's time for Choi, Patrick, and I to return him to the ocean. The turtle is being loaded onto the ocean vet boat, Bones. From here, Neil, Choi, and Patrick will transfer the turtle to its release site. Neil and the team have selected a location that is rich with seagrass beds, the perfect habitat for this juvenile green sea turtle to thrive. Thanks, Patrick. You're the Bermuda Turtle Project, the Stranding Network, and the conservation projects that support the research and protection of these marine turtles around the world make a profound difference, but there's still so much more that can be done. We wish this guy all the best. He has a tough road ahead as he continues on his epic journey. Good luck, little one. This little green sea turtle is once again free to roam the seagrass beds of Bermuda. 
It's thanks to the continued efforts from all the individuals featured in this program that the battle to get these turtles off the endangered species list may eventually be won. Next time on Ocean Vet, Neil and his team are on a rescue mission to save a prehistoric shark. They'll have to utilize all of their skills and expertise if they are to save this animal and ensure it returns safely back into the deep. This is Dr. Neil Burney. He lives in Bermuda, a stunning Atlantic island 640 miles east of North Carolina, USA. So now the, yeah. He spent the last 30 years practicing veterinary medicine, but now he's transferring his veterinary skills to help save, protect, and learn more about the incredible marine life of Bermuda's ocean. This is a completely wild shark. Alongside his dedicated ocean vet team are a number of scientists, yeah, this and here, marine this biologists, off the back fin. and specialist master divers, helping to perform a number of unique and dangerous procedures in a bid to safeguard critically important marine species. Together, the team will be fitting satellite tags to huge tiger sharks, saving precious green turtles, dissecting giant blue marlin, and obtaining unique toxin samples from 45-ton migrating humpback whales. Yay! Whoa! My knees are like jello. Yes, man. This is Bermuda, home to Dr. Neil Burney, the ocean vet. Sharks. They have existed for over 420 million years. They were around before land vertebrates and even before plant species colonized the continents. They are without question one of the most perfectly formed of all planet Earth's predators. The six gill shark like many shark species, is listed as near-threatened. Cruising Bermuda's inky depths at well over 2,000 feet, they often fall foul of deep-sea commercial fishing lines set down for table species such as the Atlantic wreckfish. With no real commercial value, these massive sharks are hauled to the surface, killed, and used as bait. Okay, the shark, the shark is uh, maybe 80 feet down right now. You know, Get Drew in the water. In this episode, the Ocean Vet team are on a rescue mission. They'll be working alongside Andrew Marshall and Stevie Cabral, two local commercial fishermen fishing for deep sea wreckfish. Want to get it? We'll sort that out later. Maybe Drew. Andrew has requested the assistance of the Ocean Vet team to attempt the rescue and release of any six skill sharks that are accidentally caught. Yes, yeah, a lot of gear to transfer. You can see there's a big roly sea, so it's all hands on deck. Under the water, Nia will complete a dangerous assessment dive to monitor the condition of a six gill shark as it ascends from the depths. The team will also be working waterside to free this monster shark, carefully removing the tangled fishing lines and hooks. Slap it with the helia hat, man. Slap it as hard as you can. No, hard as you can. All your weight. Finally, Choi Ming, the series marine biologist, assists Neil to install a sophisticated PSAT tracking computer, a tag that will reveal if the shark makes it back to the ocean floor and indeed survives. Ah, that is a lot of the shark. Local fishermen think it's unlikely a six skill will make it through the catch and release. The ocean vet team are on a mission to prove it can be done. So this is a genuine first for us. We've never rescued a shark from commercial fishing lines, and we've never seen a six gill. So it's gonna be very interesting what happens today. Basically with the six gills, they live down deep. When the guys go wreck fishing, sometimes the six gills will get tangled up in the wreck fishing gear and they get brought to the surface. Stevie and Andrew are out there wreck fishing right now, and they've invited us out today to help them rescue any sharks that might get brought up in the line. Here we go. Hoses in. The Ocean Vet team have a vast amount of experience tagging and releasing sharks. 
including large species like the tiger shark. But Choi and Neil have yet to even see a six gill, let alone attempting to rescue one from commercial fishing lines. Then we've got at least that is secure. The team need to be able to alter their technique on the fly if they're to stand any chance of getting this right. As always, Neil and Choi are supported by the entire Ocean Vet team. Andrew Kirkpatrick is the underwater videographer and will help Neil assess the six-gill shark as it's brought up to the boat. Dylan Ward is taking control of the Ocean Vet boat Bones, and Oscar Doyce is piloting the Ocean Vet rib, deploying divers and supporting the needs of the entire team. The commercial fishing boat Bay Roots is six kilometers, four miles, south of Bermuda's southwest edge. The ocean floor drops away quickly here, reaching depths of 5,000 feet in many places. The Atlantic wreckfish, the fisherman's target species, lives right along this deep shelf, sharing the same habitat as the six-gill shark. So if the guys do bring a six-gill up to the surface today, we're going to try to fit it with this. This is a PSAT archival tag and it's programmed to record the shark's depth changes after it returns to the depths. That way we'll be able to see whether it's survived its trip to the surface and hopefully our release. And I'll, you hold on to it, Tom. Sure. At $3,000 a tag, the archival PSAT computer represents a significant financial investment. But this tag won't just be used to acknowledge the success or failure of a six-skill rescue. It will also reveal new and exciting movement information of a species the team knows very little about. Now I'm going to insert this large PSAT archival tag into the fish. Neil and the crew have used these tags on four other species. One was attached to a Galapagos shark to understand more about their long-range migrations. All so right, now so I'm going to plant the tube on Two this. of Bermuda's spotted eagle rays also had PSAT tags installed, and the team even managed to install one on a wahoo and to one of the most powerful predators in the Atlantic, the mighty blue marlin. This fish is going to swim, man. He's the dorsal's up, he's going to swim, I tell you. Once deployed, the computer will record the six-gill shark's depth, the temperature of the water, and ambient light levels. This information is stored in the tag's memory and will upload to satellites when it pops off. So I can see bay routes directly ahead of us. We've got a big swell, so I'm going to keep the boat pointed into the wind as we get all our gear ready for a fairly critical transfer onto Andrew's boat. Enjoy. The team need to move lots of equipment to attempt to rescue. What they don't realize is the fishermen have already started pulling up one of their deep set lines. It's not until Choi boards the boat that the crew finds out there may be a six-gill shark on the end of the line. We gotta, we, gotta go look at it. we gotta go look at it, and we gotta get all our gear on, man. It's gonna be a while, so just slow him up. Whatever it is, it's on its way up, and the team need to be ready for it. Okay, they think that, okay, the shark, the shark is uh, maybe 80 feet down right now. You know, let's get Drew in the water. Cameraman Andy on the boat here. He's gonna go boat to rib to boat with a very expensive camera, so it's all going down now. We got Drew jumping in the water. Fish is coming up, so we're gonna send him down just to be the first eyes on it to actually see what is on the line. And if it's a big shark, then uh, we'll just make a game plan on the fly. Six-gill sharks have a nasty habit of rolling when caught. Sadly, each roll wraps the animal into more hooks and cable. It's this scenario that the teams don't usually deal with. To work out the best way to handle the rescue, Neil and Kirkpatrick need to go down and assess what's on the end of the line. Drew and I are really excited to see if we can get overboard and see if we can do something to help this shark if it is indeed a six gun. So we're setting up our comm system here. This links up to the comm mast that the guys have. That way, when they're at 80 feet or whatever depth they need to go to, then uh, we can uh, be communicating with them. We can speak, and we can figure out exactly what needs to be done just to give us a couple extra minutes. And um, yeah, so just going to set it up, drop in the water. With the dive brief and safety checks complete, Neil and Kirkpatrick are ready to dive. Three, two, one, go. 
After a brief moment of disorientation, Neil and Kirkpatrick start their descent straight down. This animal has been hauled from its home over 5,000 feet below the team. The wreck fish have long worked themselves free. This is the six gill shark the team are now faced with saving. OK, so you have a visual of a fish on the line, but you are not sure what it is yet. This is indeed, I suspect, a large six gill, a large six gill shark. He has taken the second hook, and there's several other hooks wrapped around him. This is probably a fish of over several hundred pounds, six or seven hundred pounds. We have multiple hooks wrapped over him. However, I believe we shall be able to disentangle this fish fairly easily. That is my hope. Coming up, Neil works to free some of the hooks in line while deep in the ocean then attempts to attach a tail rope to raise this huge shark the final 100 feet to the surface. Deep one out. Once at the side of the boat, the team will work quickly to remove the final hooks and line before finally attaching the PSAT computer, a piece of technology that will reveal if the team have successfully saved the life of this six-gill shark. So now that we have identified it is actually a six gill, quite a large one, we're going to get our head rope out, our tail rope out, and I'm going to prepare the sling. These guys can be huge, fully grown. Uh, they can be 14, 15 feet long and 1,000 pounds. We don't know how big it is yet, because we're going to measure it, but it's a huge animal. So I'm just pulling out all the stops, as I've never dealt with one of these before. This is the situation. The fish has got a hook caught in the corner of his mouth. But the, the thing that's bringing him up is the entanglement. I'm keen that we don't get him up to the surface and then have him pop that hook and roll around further and get more of a mess. Get more tangled. And we yeah. don't have his head controlled. Right. I think if we at least get his tail controlled from the outset, I can go put a tail rope on him now. Right. And then we'll have his tail rope as you get him up. Right. So I'm thinking I'm going to put my dive gear back on and put a tail rope on him with a large buoy All right. that will hold him. If we get him to within 10 feet of the surface, I can simply dive down and snag that rope. All right. The team prepare for the procedure and head back out to the shark as quickly as possible. It's now been just over seven minutes since the team started the rescue. Every minute that passes reduces the chances of a successful release. The decision to attach the tail rope underwater is not just to prevent the animal further wrapping in the lines, but crucially to reduce the time the shark spends at the side of the boat. Neil manages to secure the rope on the tail and indicates to the surface with several sharp tugs. The shark is now semi-secured, preventing any further rolling in the fishing lines. Tail rope is on! The large orange float helps lift the shark's tail up and away from the fishing line. As this happens, the fishing wraps on the shark tighten and force the animal to reverse its original roll further freeing the shark. So as you can see, the shark is now held with the tail rope. It's now into a rope, and it's now ready to be lifted up. I'm really excited. This is a big female six-gill shark, the first I've ever seen. And I believe that we'll be able to get a tag in her and check her survival without a lot of undue distress and trauma to this fish. OK, let me get off the bow. Next, the team work together to secure this massive six gill to the side of the boat, a position that will allow the final untangle and tagging procedure. Wow. Oh, my gosh. That is like a dinosaur on the end of the line. All right. 
So we've got our tail rope here. What I'll do, actually, excellent. They're very sluggish, which is what we heard, but this is fantastic. She's got uh, nowhere near the fight of a large tiger shark, which is good. But she's rolling a little bit, so she still looks in uh, good condition to me. A few little bumps and bruises, but nothing serious. So I'm just gonna tie off her tail right here. And then once she's tied on, we'll get this thing. Oh my God, look at the green eyes. It's like a goblin. The team braced the shark using the same sling as they used whilst working with the tiger sharks. Together with the tail rope, this holds the animal in place so Neil and Choi can start to remove the final hooks and line. So now I have the hook attached. I'm going to cut these away. Right. And right. then we can get the deep rope, deep one out. Yeah. Neil has cut the last hook away from the commercial fishing line and attached it to a rope leader to control the head of the shark. This is a much bigger animal than any of the tiger sharks we deal with, but luckily they don't seem to put up as uh, bad of a fight. Look at the glowing green eyes. That thing is incredible. These guys have come from a deep, dark, cold environment. Basically, it's devoid of light, hence the large green eyes. He's down, usually they're anywhere from 1,000 to maybe 5,000 feet deep. These guys have been around so long, they actually predate flowers on planet Earth. This is a true living fossil right here. Six gill sharks are considered the oldest of all modern sharks, dating back some 190 million years. They were around during the early Jurassic period and have had the benefit of an unimaginable time period to evolve into the animal Neil and Choi are fighting to rescue. All right, so with the shark secure, we're gonna go for our DNA sample. So I've got my scissors here. Neil's just gonna take a clip off the dorsal fin, which you can see is really far back on these guys. Thanks, Joey. Bumpy conditions to work yep. in, huh? There we go. Oh, sweet. So, this DNA is going to go to Mamu Shivji at Nova Southeastern University, contribute to his massive database of sharks taken from all around the world. Yeah, I think he's going to be happy as this is a brand new species from Bermuda. So OK, we're going to take a measurement now on this animal. I'm going to guess, you know, 12 or 13 feet, maybe. These guys are very long and lean. So, Joy, be aware, his head is free. Yeah. Because the hook came out, so I'm going to be trying to hold this, and sure. then I'm going to measure back. Don't pull it tight until yeah. I'm back here. I know. We're going to measure the first nerve of the fish, and then we'll measure the second two. Okay, okay yeah, that works better, yeah. Because right. I was going to say, the measurement might end up being approximate because of the way this guy wiggles. Neil shows an astonishing amount of confidence working around this massive shark. He's so focused on the job in hand that he is oblivious to the fact that this massive predator has its jaws wide open inches from his head. He's happy to put his life on the line while they collect the data and work to free this six gill shark. So we're gonna take her tail length to add to that 11 feet. Yeah, I can see it. It's uh, three foot two on the tail length. Three foot two plus 11. 14 foot, two inch, six gill shark. That, Let's do her girth. That is a monstrous yeah. animal. 59 inch girth. 59, 59 inch. inch. Just shy of five, just, just five, just shy five feet around her tummy. That is a big girl. So we've got our uh, DNA clip. We've done our measurements. We know what that are. We know it's a female. So the last thing to do is stick the uh, tag in, and then uh, we can release her, and uh, hopefully she swims off happy. OK, here's the scalpel. Thank you. Gentle. I'm going to make a little cut in the skin, just big enough to enter the tag. And then we're going to place it into the tissues beneath the skin. The skin is very tough. It's like trying to cut sandpaper. And with this action of the waves, I'm just trying to avoid slicing my finger. All right. That should be big enough. Yeah, yeah. All right, now you may need. Yeah, we're going to have to drive, drive. drive this with some force. It's it, it's it, it's planted. Well done. So the archival tag is firmly planted in her skin and should survive for the four months that we're going to record data from this shark. 
Now it's merely a question of releasing her. I'm gonna put my dive gear on so that I can make sure this shark swims away. So this has been so exciting. And now we've got this big female six gill and I'm gonna release her. And I'm really keen to see that she swims away. Okay, so Neil's in position, I'm in position. We're ready to drop the ropes, so we're all set to have this girl swim away. Okay, guys. Excellent. Ah, that is a lot of uh, shark. Neil carefully moves the shark through the water to oxygenate its massive body. A journey close to one mile straight down lay ahead of this incredible prehistoric creature. With the tag firmly in place, the ocean vet team can now establish that the shark makes it back to the ocean floor and indeed survives. The shark eventually finds its fins and starts to power down into the deep. As it passes through 60 feet of water, it starts to pull away. Neil is left watching as the animal the team have worked so hard to rescue successfully swims down and out of sight. That was absolutely phenomenal. That shark swam a circle. I was holding onto I could feel her start to kick underneath me. She swam back as if to look at the boat, swam under the keel. I thought, is she going to hit the rudder? No. Straight down, and we followed her down probably to about 85, 90, maybe even 90 feet down. And she was just going like a freight train, swimming and kicking back down into the abyss from whence she came. It was phenomenal. Great job, everybody on Shabbat Cheese. Really well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Just spectacular well job, man. Cool. And Dylan, good job, man. Love it. Best job in the world. The data from the PSAT tag did eventually reveal the shark's successful journey back to its home some 5,000 feet down. It tracked the shark's regular movements over the following four months and served to prove that although at great cost and effort, it is worth trying to rescue these incredible animals. A little disappointing that you didn't get any wreckfish. Since the filming of this project, the Ocean Vet team have spoken with other local commercial fishermen and stand by to assist as they continue to save, protect, rescue, and learn more about the incredible marine life in Bermuda's beautiful ocean. Next time on Ocean Vet, Neil and his team witness the deep spawning aggregations of Bermuda's famous black grouper. So now we're into our oxygenated bath. We're going to turn him right ways up. They're on a mission to test new tagging methods, both on the seafloor, in midwater, and at the surface. Their goal is to map the population dynamic of this important commercial species helping the Department of Fisheries with their mission to ensure the survival of a key Bermuda fishery.